Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's August 29th, 2013, and here are our top stories. Tonight, the Syrian war heats up. Are you paying attention? And the Bankster Cartel are engineering our economic destruction. Then, David Knight sits down with two former cops who explain what to do when you get pulled over. All this and more on the InfoWars Nightly News. Well, what is the definition of a warmonger? Is it somebody that just pushes for war? You know, a fishmonger was somebody who sold fish. A fleshmonger was somebody who sold flesh, a pimp. Well, a warmonger is somebody who is selling war. They're selling war and nobody is buying it. And there's a good reason for the fact that they've only got a 9% approval rate. In an article from InfoWars called Alternative Media Blocks Globalist Attempt to Launch World War III, we point out that it was just a month ago that you had the public affairs of Department of Defense talking about how they were having difficulty, talking about how they didn't have any credibility. They couldn't sell their narrative. You even had lower level staffers saying, what we're putting out is mindless propaganda and the public isn't buying it. And then of course, the alternative media has covered in great detail the fact that James Clapper, the NSA, said that he had least untruthful manner that he had told about what had happened. And basically he had lied. And so what we're showing is that it's not just being least untruthful, it's actually lies. They've lied to us about the causes of war, they've lied to us about how they conducted war, and they have lied to us about the price of war, the casualties of war, and the public just isn't buying it. This is a war that the 1% of the 1% wants. And this is something that is being pushed back by the alternative media. The alternative media is standing between us and World War III. In an article from StoryLeak.com, they point out that Brzezinski is saying that the global political awakening is making the Syrian war difficult. Yes, difficult for them to sell. Now, remember who Brzezinski is. He was the national security advisor for Jimmy Carter. And he was also a founder of the Trilateral Commission. And as a national security advisor for Jimmy Carter, he created Al-Qaeda. He created the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, which became Al-Qaeda. And 35 years ago, he was able to do whatever he wanted to. And he was basically able to sell that to the American public, to the world public, because he had the media following lockstep behind him, like Operation Mockingbird. But today, there is what he calls a global political awakening. He says a policy of force that is based on Western, and in some cases, former colonial powers does not seem to me to be a very promising avenue to an eventual solution to the regional problem. In other words, they just are having a hard time selling war and neo-colonialism. Now, one of the reasons that's working is because of alternative media and because of your support for Prison Planet TV and InfoWars. So don't forget to get a subscription and support this operation. And you can also pass that along to your friends and family. Up to 10 people can watch that simultaneously along with you. Now, in the UK, there's actually a debate that's going on of sorts. Although David Cameron, the Prime Minister, says that the British military attack will be a judgment call. And guess who gets to make that judgment? It'll probably be just him. But the UK Prime Minister said that he had no smoking piece of intelligence linking chemical weapon attacks to the Syrian regime. That's right. That's what we've been pointing out. But he argued in favor of military intervention anyway and said that he believed that forces loyal to Bashar Assad did use poisonous gas against the Syrian people, quote, right in front of our eyes. Well, the problem is that it wasn't right in front of our eyes. And what we're seeing is a narrative that is changing, a narrative that is falling apart before our eyes. Doctors Without Borders was a source of information that they kept going back to and referring, and yet Doctors Without Borders is now saying that the real death toll is 355, not the 1,300 to 1,600 that was originally claimed by rebel factions. So even Doctors Without Borders is pushing back against that. And if you remember, back in May, we had the UN went into Syria and looked at a previous chemical attack, and they identified it as being sarin gas. In an article from the Huffington Post, we had an uh, investigator, Del Ponte, who was a UN investigator uh, for the Swiss Italian television, uh, gave an interview to them and said, our investigators have been in neighboring countries interviewing victims, doctors, field hospitals. According to the report last week, which I've seen, there's strong concrete suspicion, yet not incontrovertible proof that the use of sarin gas was used from the way the victims were treated. Now, this is the important point, she says. 
This was used on the part of the opposition, the rebels, not by the government authorities. So we have an incident just three months ago where UN investigators said that they believed that the rebels had used sarin gas. However, we're supposed to not care about who used it, where it came from, not even whether or not it was sarin gas. If it was just a chemical attack, we should go in and do something about it because now, and the death toll is 355, not to say that it wasn't a horrible incident, not to say that 355 people killed isn't a tragedy, especially the way they died, but think about how many hundreds of thousands of people are going to die. Think about the fact that the Syrian war has already been going on for two years, and already we've had over 100,000 casualties. Think about the fact that the antagonist in this war is Al-Qaeda, going back to what Zbigniew Brzezinski and the American government created back in the late 1970s. They're our ally there, although they're the reason for all the oppression that we have against the Bill of Rights and against us as citizens here at home. And as Kucinich pointed out, we are going to now act as their air force in Syria. Now, is Obama making the case to Congress for war? No, he's not going to bother with that. Here's what a candidate Obama said. This is an article from Infowars.com. And this is based on an interview with Charlie Savage in December 20th of 2007. Remember, this was just before the primaries are going to begin in Iowa and New Hampshire. And he was asked by Charlie Savage, under what circumstances would the president have constitutional authority to bomb Iran at that time without seeking use of force authorization from Congress in a situation that does not involve stopping an imminent threat? That's the key. And Obama said the president does not have power under the Constitution to unilaterally authorize a military attack in a situation that does not involve stopping an actual or an imminent threat to the nation. Now that's what Obama said as a candidate, just as the primaries were beginning to start, because he knew that the American people don't want endless wars. We've seen this happening now since the end of World War II, and we're sick and tired of being lied to. We're sick and tired of paying for it in our lives and in our money. So he was telling people what was in the Constitution, but now President Obama is doing exactly the opposite. He is ignoring Congress, and this was pointed out yesterday in a story by, uh, about Scott Rigel, who is a Virginia representative, a Republican. And he was asking for John Boehner to call back Congress because Congress is not in session. This is all happening without Congress even being in session, let alone voting on this. Now today, we have a Democrat taking on Democrat leadership on this, and this is uh, New York Representative Gerald Nadler, ranking Democrat on the House Judiciary Subcommittee on the Constitution and Civil Justice, stated the obvious on Wednesday. He said the Constitution requires that barring an attack on the United States or an imminent threat to the U.S., same wording as the President, they know what the Constitution says, they just won't follow it. Any decision to use military force can only be made by Congress, not by the President. The decision to go to war, and we should be clear, launching a military strike on another country, justified or not, is an act of war. That is reserved by the Constitution to the American people, acting through their elected representatives in Congress. And since there is no imminent threat to the United States, there is no legal justification for bypassing the constitutionally required congressional authorization. Consultation, as Obama has put it with Congress, is not sufficient. The Constitution requires congressional authorization. Now, we had this discussion just a couple of months ago when John Kerry was confirmed as Secretary of State. You remember Rand Paul questioned him on this very thing, and he dodged it. But Leon Panetta did not dodge the question when he was asked this by Jeff Sessions when he was being confirmed for Secretary of Defense. He plainly stated that, in his opinion, he didn't believe that he needed to go to Congress. He said he was going to get his authorization from NATO or the UN, if he was going to get it from anybody else, and indicated that he just might act unilaterally without anybody agreeing to it. And that's what we're seeing going on now. And, of course, Jeff Sessions was taken back by that, but he didn't do what he should have done. And that is say, you're not qualified for the office then, and you need to be impeached. Uh, now, Cruz has pointed out, and this is a great uh, little graphic that he tweeted out today. Senator Cruz has also taken this on. And he's asking the same question that Representative Scott Rigel of Virginia said yesterday, and that is, why aren't we having a discussion? They're having this discussion in England, but look at the empty chairs there in the U.S. Congress, in the U.S. Senate, in the U.S. House. 
Nothing is being talked about. We're just waiting around to see whether or not it suits Obama to start a war without anybody's approval, with only a 9% approval rate, according to major scientific polls, without the approval as required in the Constitution by the Congress. So what is he waiting for? Well, there's speculation. We have an article from Paul Joseph Watson, and it's a tweet that says that they believe that they're waiting for the UN inspectors to leave on Saturday before they start the attack. And then a, an article also on InfoWars from Steve Watson says that intelligence sources say that Obama is stalling on Syria in order to make a deal with Putin. What he's saying is here that uh, they're speculating that the U.S. would soften its military action against the Assad regime and his army and reduce it to a token blow. Of course, people will die with that token blow. After which the American and Russian presidents would announce the convening of Geneva II to hammer out a solution of the Syrian crisis and end the civil war. There you go. Obama's got his distraction for domestic purposes, and he might even get a peace prize if he can work out something with Obama, with uh, Putin and a Geneva II conference. That brings us to our quote of the day from Bill Clinton, and he said, We can't be so fixated on our desire to preserve the rights of ordinary Americans. Isn't that sad? Well, you know, Bill Clinton doesn't have a desire <laughs> to preserve the rights of ordinary Americans. He took an oath, actually. All these people took oaths. And so whether they have a desire or not, they took an oath, and they're violating that oath on a regular basis. Now, of course, it's to the benefit of our rulers to cover up what's going on here at home. We have endless scandals because of criminal illegal activity being conducted by the administration and it's not just the Obama administration although it's gotten to new heights and and uh, new extents with the Obama administration but this is going on, on a regular basis and of course there's failure in the economy and that is falling on the people at the lowest rungs of the economic scale and they're starting to take to the streets what brings me out here is, uh, well, really long-standing support in my own denomination for workers and for workers' rights. Today we're out here to fight for workers' rights, particularly in the restaurant industry, to have a livable wage. My name is Sophia Portier, and I'm out here with United Students Against Sweatshops, and we're supporting the Fight for 15. Fight for 15 is a campaign that fast food workers are running across the country, um, trying to attain $15 an hour for the work that they do. This is an extension of Dr. King's work 50 years ago uh, that was a march on Washington for freedom and for jobs. I've been a fast food worker myself and so there's no reason why people who do those types of jobs can't get a living wage. They deserve to be paid the wage that, that, that their work is worth and their work is worth a lot more than they're being paid now. $15 an hour to work at fast food, that's a little high. What would you say to those people? I would say that they should work as a fast food worker for a little while and see what it's like to do that type of job. You know, the way the rhetoric always runs on these things is uh, if we're going to give them a pay raise, $15 an hour, then we're going to have to cut back on the number of workers we have. Nobody talks about cutting the profit margin. That $15, when it goes into the pockets of the, of the normal people, is going to go back into the market economy. So it actually does better, uh, better for the economy than not paying them. When you don't pay them, um, they, they have a much harder time living. They have to, they have to then rely on all of the public, uh, public programs that we have. Good for the union makes us One more time. the current health care system, the Obamacare, where employers are actually cutting their workers' hours so the workers can't qualify for health care. Does that concern you? Right. That's, that's another big problem. Not everyone has access to medical care, to health care. The kinds of actions that you're talking about where people are cutting uh, hours so that someone falls just underneath the health care threshold, that's the, that's, that's the action of corporate autocracy. That's the action of a corporate system that really does not care for the people that it that it employs really does not care for anything other than their own bottom line and if that means they have to subject people to inhumane treatment in order to get that bottom line that's what they'll do well as we said at the beginning of the program the obvious beneficiaries of war are the people who sell the weapons but of course there are bankers who also make a lot of money in the uncertain economic times the rockefeller family as well as the rothschild family both made their initial fortunes profiteering off of war and this last week, we just saw a big confab 
of bankers taking place in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And of course, the mainstream media has pretty much ignored this or speculated as to who the next Fed chairman is going to be. But somebody who really knows these guys, Jim Rogers, former investor and commodities tycoon, had a lot to say about this. And here's what he said. Whether they keep printing or stop printing money globally, it's going to end badly. Banks are not going to be lending. Financial markets are going to go down. Currency markets are going to go in great turmoil. You've got a bubble in some sectors. You have inflation, and then you have interest rates going up. It's a mess because printing money is artificial. It's never worked. And as the economy slows down, Roger, Rogers predicts they're going to take money wherever they can. They're going to take our bank accounts and our retirement accounts. We've had perilous times, and it's going to get worse. It's coming. Be worried. Be very careful. Well, they may be coming after your bank accounts. They may be sending the country to war, but there's a little bit of a silver lining. It turns out that Naked Juice has a class action law settlement that has just been announced, and you may be able to get $45 back from Pepsi. In a story from Natural News, I report that Naked Juice intentionally used misleading language to give consumers the false impression that the beverage's vitamin content is due to nutritious fruits and juices rather than added synthetic compounds. And Pepsi contained a laundry list of synthetic chemicals, including calcium panthothenate, synthetically produced from formaldehyde. And starting today, you can now be eligible to receive up to $45 from Pepsi. Any person who claims to have purchased Naked Juice, even if they have no proof of such a purchase, can now participate in a class action claim and receive up to a $45 check as part of the settlement. And, of course, that would just about pay for a Prison Planet TV subscription. And it would help to support our operation. So please consider that. We'll stick around right after the break. We've got an interview with Jamie Belasia and Stephen Montague. Now, they're with DWIDude.com and 420Dude.com. They're going to have some really important information for you if you get pulled over by the police. And that all happens to us, unfortunately, from time to time. So stay tuned right after the break. Now you can watch Alex Jones live at Infowars.com forward slash show. You'll find links to all of our content there and a free 15-day trial for Prison Planet TV. You can also browse the network, the Infowars Nightly News, and over 60 movies and documentaries all together in one place. You can watch the Alex Jones Radio Show live as it happens. So check it out, Infowars.com forward slash show. Many anthropologists and archaeologists believe that before man even discovered uh, the power to harness and use fire, we were involved in agrarian activities. That is, taking the seeds of plants and then replanting them to produce more. The very foundation of our modern civilization and human culture is centered around the planting and cultivation of edible plants. Here are some of the amazing deals at InfoWars Seed Center at InfoWarsShop.com. The Survival Seed Vault by My Patriot Supply features only the finest survival heirloom seeds for a robust and hardy garden, even in the toughest times. We also have starter varieties of the deluxe seed packages for fruit, salads, salsa, peppers, medical herbs, and more. Go to the InfoWars Seed Center at InfoWarsShop.com. And remember, the revolution against tyranny is growing. Well, I'm joined in the studio today with two former police officers who are now helping people who are really kind of becoming victims of the police state that we see developing. I've got with me Jamie Belasia. Hi, how you doing, Jamie? Great and to be Steve here. Montague. Thank you, Steve, for coming in, and thank, thank you, you for doing this. Now, Steve, you're an investigator, and Jamie, you're a lawyer. I'm a right? criminal and defense trial lawyer. That's right, and your website is dwidude.com and 420dude.com. That's right. right. Okay, good. And you've got some information that is, uh, of course, you practice here locally, uh, and we've got a book that we've just started carrying at infowarsstore.com, uh, which is Texas DWI Survival Guide. But that book is a lot broader than just Texas because we see these same types of tactics being done across the country, right? Every state will have its own specific uh, punishments or, you know, probation conditions, things like that. But overall, uh, that book can tell you all around this country what to do, what not to do, 
what mm -hmm. to say and what not to say mm -hmm. to keep yourself out of trouble. Mm -hmm. Now, we were talking a little bit just before the interview, and court fees all over the country. I know uh, I came here from North Carolina. They're escalating and getting more and more expensive all the time. But you were talking about how expensive they are here in Texas. And, and it kind of almost turns into kind of a debtor's prison for people that get caught up in a traffic violation, doesn't it? Tell, tell the audience a little bit about that here. If we specifically address DWI because they give you a driver's license surcharge, then in order, to, if, on a plain vanilla DWI, if you're convicted, you'll pay $1,000 a year for three years in order to keep your driver's license valid. Mm. Now, if you don't keep up with your surcharge payments, then they'll take away your license. How do you get to work? How do you feed your children or take them to school? Right. You drive. Mm -hmm. So then they stop you for driving without a license. Another class B misdemeanor, another potential jail or probation term, another fine, and interestingly enough, another surcharge. Yeah. Uh, if because you don't have a valid driver's license, you don't have insurance, because you're not going to get auto insurance without a driver's license. Mm. So you'll also be cited for fair to have auto insurance. Guess what comes with that ticket? Oh, big penalties, yeah. And another surcharge. Mm -hmm. It never stops. Oh. And it, it amounts to, like you said, a debtor's prison. Uh, someone who makes a lot of money, who's self-employed and, and can survive a DWI conviction, uh, can, can pay the bribe off and go about their business. But anyone else? A lot of people in today's economy have a hard time coming up with enough money to hire mm -hmm. uh, a credible and, and respected DWI attorney and to pay these fines and, and surcharges without just being buried. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, we've got traffic stops all over the country, and they, of course they vary from region to region, but the essence of it is essentially the same. Tell, tell people what your advice to them is when they get pulled over as a, as a former cop and as a a, a lawyer representing people who have had these problems, what, what would your advice be? Well, un unfortunately, the poli local police officers have become either the revenuers or the regulators. They'll set up, like in Texas, a DWI checkpoint because we don't have DWI checkpoints. But what's the difference? Once you're in line at the checkpoint and you roll down your window to answer their questions, you're being investigated for whatever they can find mm -hmm. or whatever they're looking for. It's like a roadside audit. That's right. Yeah. You're being just like yeah. IRS called you in and was looking over your taxes. Mm -hmm. um, Seatbelt violations, a warrant from a ticket you failed to pay from years past, um, maybe even parking tickets you're not even aware of because somebody took them off your windshield wiper before you got back to your car. Mm -hmm. Any of these things can cause you to be held by the police. Mm -hmm. um, what they're going to do at that point is you know, they're going to get your driver's license, they're going to ask you for your proof of insurance, maybe your registration, depending on what state you're in. I advise people have your driver's license, registration, and insurance card where you can get to them quickly. Always be polite to the officers, but the less you say, the better. They don't need to know where you're coming from, they don't need to know where you're going, they don't need to know what you've been doing. Mm -hmm. To be honest, that's none of their business if you're a law-abiding citizen on your way to work or home or wherever you're going. So I just tell people, you know, tell the police officer um, that you have what he's required of you and that you don't wish to answer any questions. Mm -hmm. That you'd like to call your attorney if possible, which they'll never let you do that. But by putting that buzzword in their ear, they know that you know some of your rights at least. Mm -hmm. And that's very important. I tell people on a DWI investigation, never take the field sobriety test. Mm -hmm. You're going to fail them. Mm -hmm. Don't take um, one of those well, hands. Well, and here in, here in uh, Texas, they have mandatory blood samples that they take from people. It's very they interesting. They, they ask you to take the field sobriety test so they can develop probable cause that you're intoxicated. You say, no, I don't want to take those tests. That becomes probable cause to get your blood. <laughs> it makes no sense logically or with reason wow. that a lack of evidence gets a search warrant, but that's exactly what they're doing in Texas and the other states around the nation. Mm. DWI law mirrors itself around the country. Mm -hmm. Each state has one thing that's worse, one thing that's not as bad as the next state. Now, when you say that you don't want to answer questions, you have to be very explicit that you're invoking your Fifth Amendment protection, don't you? You can't just say, I don't want to answer any questions. Right. Or... Um, you know, I want to remain silent. The Supreme Court just had a case released in June, Salinas versus Texas. 
And this just turns the Fifth Amendment on its head in the last 30 or 40 years of us understanding the Miranda rights. It's been mm -hmm. 50 years now that Miranda's been with us, mm -hmm. in which you um, have the right to remain silent. The Supreme Court has decided that you have to say to the officer who's questioning you, I invoke my Fifth Amendment right to remain silent. Well, you know, you have to speak <laughs> to invoke your right to remain silent. That's right. I don't like that. Right. Uh, and yeah, it really turns Miranda upside down. Well, the Supreme down. Court has said that if you just remain silent, that can be introduced as evidence of guilt against you. It's almost like a guilty conscience. Hmm. If you, as a police officer, say, uh, hey, do you have any drugs in your car? Well, I don't, but I don't want to answer your question. I thought the movie and the TV said I could remain silent. So I remain silent. There's proof of guilt because I didn't answer your question and deny it. Wow. So I have really two choices. Say, answer your question and, and not invoke my right to remain silent. No, sir, I don't have any drugs in my car. Or say, I invoke my right to remain silent. Now, what's a police officer going to do when he asks you, do you have drugs in your car? And you say, I invoke my Fifth <laughs> Amendment right to remain silent. Okay. He's going to figure out a way to get you out of that car and search your car. Mm -hmm. And then try to later create justification for the search. Mm -hmm. We see that all the time mm -hmm. amongst police officers. Or perhaps even drop something there to justify it. I, I hate to say... He's a dishonest cop. Yeah. It, it happens. Yeah. I yeah. know it happens. Yeah. Planted drugs uh, in search warrants. I know that things have been planted in houses. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a sad state of affairs. Now, Steve, we were talking just before the uh, interview about the nature of policing and how that's changed. And since you fellows were police officers, talk to the audience a little bit about that, what, you, what you've seen. Happen. Well, one of the things that I see that's changed so much is we were able to make decisions as police officers based on common sense and good judgment, experience and training. And uh, now the majority of police officers, and I do want to say right now that Jamie and I both are very thankful for all the great job that the good police officers uh, men and women uh, do out here. That's right. um, there are a lot of them, but there's a lot of bad ones too, as we all know. Um, and you were just saying that they just changed the qualifications for the Austin Police Department that you don't have to have a college degree anymore. Is that correct? I understand that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. wow. mm -hmm. uh, that kind of dovetails in with the, the case out of the Northeast. I, I can't remember if it was Connecticut or Rhode Island. There was a police officer who applied for a job and they told him his IQ was too high. And uh, it was over 100. And uh, so he sued them. And actually, uh, the court decided in favor of the police department, said, no, they have a, a right to particularly screen for low intelligence. What an insult to officers with intelligence. Yes. That, that he was too smart to be a cop. Yes. I would like to say that, that obviously every instance or every occasion or occurrence that a police officer goes to has its own set of circumstances. And I don't care how thick the book is mm -hmm. uh, in regards to the general orders that a police officer has to operate by, there's always extenuating circumstances. Mm -hmm. They're not allowed to make judgments for themselves. They're, they're bound to a certain set of rules and ideals um, that can be punishable by a verbal reprimand, days off, losing your job. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that are out there that should be able to make a decision based on what they're seeing Mm -hmm. um, but they're not allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so um, that's a lot of what's changed. Uh, the, it's the day of accountability. There are no more accidents. Someone's always got to be responsible. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, we used to fill out accident reports on a vehicle collision. Now it's called a crash report. It went <laughs> from accident to collision. Now it's a crash report. It just happens. And when officers testify, you know, they'll say, that's when I uh, drove up upon the crash. Because crash sounds bad. Uh huh. Not, you know what? I didn't see him in my mirror, and we had a little accident. Uh huh. You know that minimizes uh, what Steve was talking about a second ago on the the issue of an officer making a judgment calls on the street. Now, one thing that that I have to qualify that is by saying there are a lot of officers they're hiring now. I don't want making judgment calls. Mm -hmm. I want a supervisor watching him mm -hmm. because we used to. If you committed five traffic offenses, we would write you one ticket, and we would note the other ones on the back of the ticket in case we had to go to court. Mm -hmm. If I arrested you for um, a Class B misdemeanor and you did a bunch of little piddly things too, I mentioned them in the report. Nowadays, we're seeing our clients come in 
with every single charge stacked against them. They're hitting them every way they can in the pocketbook mm -hmm. as well as with the criminal history. Mm -hmm. I grew up, I was taught, number one, you don't kick a dog when he's down, you help somebody. But number two, once somebody's paid their price, you give them a clean slate. Now, you might want to watch a particular individual a little closer than somebody else, but mm -hmm. that's individual. Uh, now, in law enforcement, it seems to be give everybody a criminal history, stack it on them, don't ever let them walk away from it. Wow. The, you know, the surcharges, the, the uh, make them go to classes. Once the government, the court system opens up a class, be it for DWI, hot check writing, whatever, which can be helpful. Mm -hmm. I've never seen an empty class. They're always full. So in other words, when the judges are giving the conditions of probation, they're going to fill their classes up. They're going to make you take these classes, pay for them. How do you get to them if you don't have a driver's license? Yeah. It, yeah. Just, it just builds upon itself. Well, we're, we're getting close on time. Your website has a wealth of information there to help people, regardless of where they are. But tell us a little bit about this book here that we're, we're selling at InfoWarsStore.com. <clears throat> I wrote the... Um, Texas Citizens uh, DWI Survival Guide, and it's for citizens. It's for people that can read it. You can put it on the back of the toilet, mm -hmm. and when you're sitting down for your morning exercise, read the book, learn something, know your rights. America, and, and I know this from talking to the best and the brightest trial attorneys across our nation uh, in criminal law, we are ignorant of our laws, and it's just unimaginable that people will risk encounters with police and not even know their basic constitutional rights mm -hmm. or how to invoke them. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a great it's very It's very concerning, too, because as we were talking about uh, before, Steve, you, you mentioned how uh, they, they had dogs, guard dogs, and they would never have a dog, guard dog that was a fear biter. But that's what we're seeing all the time as justification. The police were concerned about their safety. So that's the justification for any kind of police brutality. And we follow that beat pretty closely here at InfoWar. So we're seeing these cases happening all over the country. So it's very important for people to understand both the mindset of the police and how to defuse the situation and how to what the right words to say to protect themselves legally. That's, that's really that important. Includes, and that's going to be pretty much the same all That includes the unreasonable searches and seizures. It's mm -hmm. just opening a door. Mm -hmm. Oh, I fear for my safety. Do you really fear for your safety or you just want to dive in the guy's car or dive right. in his pockets? That's right. And to be, not to be understood about what I was saying a while ago is that police officers at one time had the, um, they had the ability uh, to Arrest or not arrest. Or not arrest. everybody needs to go to jail. That's right. That was more my point. Maybe I wasn't clear. Mm -hmm. Every case should be judged on a base, case by case basis. Mm -hmm. You know, there are people that should be taken home. There are kids that don't need to go downtown. Mm -hmm. You know, let their parents handle it. Mm -hmm. there, there's alternatives to everybody goes to jail. Mm -hmm. that, that book will help you not go to jail. Yeah, that's really important. Well, thank you so much, Jamie Belasia. Pleasure. And Steve Montague. Thank you, and that's DWIDude.com and 420Dude.com. And the book is Texas DWI Survival Guide, but it's going to help you survive regardless of where you're located. And you can find that at InfoWarsStore.com. Well, that's it for tonight. We'll be back tomorrow at 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern. Now you can watch The Alex Jones Show live as it happens at InfoWars.com slash show. You'll find links to all of our content there and a free 15-day trial for Prison Planet TV. More than 60 movies and documentaries all in one place at InfoWars.com show.